here has a phone in your pocket? Yeah, pretty much everybody has a phone on them right now. But if we've been having this conversation just 25 years ago, none of you would have had a phone in your pocket. 25 years ago, if you had wanted to call somebody across town or across the country or across the world, you would have had to find a landline. Now, the vast majority of conversation, text message, or it's the cell phone in our pockets. If you have a phone in your pocket, you also have a camera in your pocket. Camera phone was invented just 20 years ago. Till 20 years ago, you needed a standalone camera, and you probably had to have the film sent out and developed. Flashback about to the turn of the last century, 1908, Henry Ford introduces the Model T. Ten years later, there are more cars than horses on the streets of all of the major American cities, and in very short order after that, all across the world. I have an idea for something that is in dire need of innovation right now, and that is meat. You see, these guys are horrible at turning the crops that are fed to them into meat. It takes nine calories fed to a chicken to get one calorie back out in the form of that animal's flesh. And chicken is the most efficient animal at turning crops into meat. What this means is you have to grow nine times as much land, you need nine times as much water, nine times as many pesticides and herbicides. Globally, the vast majority of the crops that we grow fed not to human beings, but to farm animals. This drives up the price of grains and legumes, and it leads to a fact wherein 800 million people are malnourished globally right now. I want to illustrate this for a second. I've got nine hummus and vegetable sandwiches back here. They're really tasty. Who would like to eat a hummus and vegetable sandwich while I finish this talk? All right, right here. There you go. And uh, I only have nine sandwiches, and I need to throw the other eight away. So that's two, four, six, eight. Who thinks that was a good idea? One sandwich gets eaten, eight get thrown away. No, of course not. That's a horrible idea. And yet that's essentially what meat production entails. And it's not just that, you've grown all of the grains, but now you've got to ship them to a feed mill. You have to operate the feed mill. You have to ship the feed to the farm. You have to operate the farm. You have to ship the animals to the slaughterhouse. You have to operate the slaughterhouse. It's multiple extra gas-guzzling, pollution-spewing vehicles, and it's multiple extra energy-intensive and polluting factories. The United Nations crunched all of the numbers, and they determined that whatever environmental issue you want to talk about, from the smallest and most local to the largest and most global, industrial animal agriculture is one of the top three causes. Water use and water pollution, soil desertification, chopping down the rainforest, species loss, climate change. On climate change, chickens, again, the least climate change-inducing animal, and yet chickens cause 40 times as much climate change per calorie of protein when compared to legumes like peas and soy and chickpeas. 40 times as much. Third reason that industrial animal agriculture needs to be reformed is global health. If you get sick or you get an infection, a doctor might put you on a course of antibiotics for maybe like five to 10 days. Farm animals are fed antibiotics for their entire lives. This means that about 70% of all antibiotics produced globally not given to sick humans, but given to well animals, to farm animals, in order to make them grow more quickly and also to allow them to live through the conditions of industrial animal agriculture. What this means is that bacteria are figuring out how to get around the antibiotics. They're becoming superbugs, and when you get sick, the antibiotics don't work. The former president of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chan, she explained that the world is heading toward a post-antibiotic era in which common infections will once again kill. This will be the end of modern medicine as we know it. 
all right, so the way meat is produced right now, it's bad for the global poor, the environment, and global health. What should we do about it? Who thinks they know? Should we go out and tell everybody, stop eating meat, go vegan? Is that the solution? Yeah, good luck with that. For 50 years, environmentalists, global health experts, and animal activists have been begging the public to eat less meat. Year after year after year, we say headlines like these. The Guardian, huge reduction in meat eating, essential to avoid climate breakdown. The Washington Post, the profound planetary consequences of eating less meat. 16,000 scientists signed dire warning to humanity over health of the planet. Recommendation of those scientists, we need to produce 90% less meat. And yet, what do you think is actually happening with meat production globally? This is the meat production trajectory. And we're expected to need 50 to 100% more meat by the year 2050. Education may be part of the solution, but education isn't going to be the whole solution. But I think we do have the solution. Instead of trying to convince people to change how they think about their diet, let's actually change the food. Let's innovate in meat. We have two key options. The first one is plant-based meat. Everything in meat exists in plants. Meat is made up of aminos, lipids, minerals, and water. That is all meat is. You know what? Plants also have lipids, aminos, minerals, and water. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how we can put plants together in a way that it exactly replicates the taste, the texture, and everything that people like about meat. We need to make plant-based meat. And that's what some companies in the United States are already doing. This is an impossible burger, and meat eaters cannot tell the difference between this plant-based meat and animal-based meat. For people who absolutely have to have meat, another option is to grow the cells directly. Instead of all of the inefficiency of feeding animals and the animal's cells multiply and grow, let's just feed the cells directly. Let's cultivate meat. This is cultivated duck. No live animals required from the company Memphis Meats, also in the United States. And this is what uh, cultivated meat production will look like at scale. It's your friendly neighborhood meat brewery. It takes about six weeks to grow a chicken to full slaughter weight. It takes six months for a pig. It takes even longer for all of the other mammals. Grow the cells directly. You can get that exact same growth in six days. So the goal of plant-based meat and cultivated meat, we need to make products that taste the same or better and that cost the same or less. And because these two technologies are so much more efficient, we should be able to meet both of those goals, but we're not even close at the moment. Plant-based meat all costs significantly more. It's less than 1% of the global meat market. Cultivated meat is 0%. It has not yet been commercialized. We need to get products that taste the same or better and that cost the same or less. That's the holy grail, and we need government support to get there. I'm sure some people in the audience are thinking, government support? to reimagine meat, and this is a, a commercial product. Why would government support a commercial product? Shouldn't capitalism do that? The thing to remember is these individual companies, their value proposition is their intellectual property. Their value proposition is their research and development. So they're doing all of this research and development, but they're basically doing it in silos. What governments do is they do research and development. It's open source, and it lifts up entire industries. So every single year, governments put billions of dollars into agricultural research focused on making agriculture more efficient and raising up the entire agriculture industry. They put tens of billions of dollars into renewable energy, both for the environment, but also to help this entire sector. And governments put about $100 billion per year into medicine, both to lift the entire biopharma industry and also for human health. For the exact same reasons, governments should be innovating in plant-based meat and cultivated meat, for agriculture, for the environment, and for global health. Look, cultivated meat, private investment in cultivated meat ever, totals about $320 million. Renewable energy has gotten $2.5 trillion just in the last decade. That's literally eight 
thousand times as much. If governments can put tens of billions of dollars every single year into renewable energy R&D, they can do exactly the same thing for plant-based and cultivated meat. The second reason is global health, climate change, global malnutrition, these are huge issues. We need all hands on deck to solve these problems. These are exactly the sorts of problems that governments should be focused on. And I want to take a step back and say this is not just a problem for developed economies. Developing economies need to be focused on plant-based and cultivated meat as well. Again, 800 million people globally are malnourished. And that's because they can't afford high-quality protein. Plant-based and cultivated meat, a far more efficient way of providing that high-quality protein, which is why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Institute for the Future have tagged plant-based and cultivated meat as two food technologies that could be essential to wiping out malnutrition globally. And then the third thing that I want to mention is the economics of it. Open source R&D has a multiplier effect across every industry. For plant-based and cultivated meat, you're talking about lifting up these entire sectors. It's going to be great for the farmers that are supplying the crops for plant-based meat. It's going to be great for manufacturing, for R&D, for science, for universities. Plant-based and cultivated meat will be a boon to the economies of the governments that invest in it. It was government investment in manufacturing and then roads that led to the ubiquity of the automobile. It was government investment in cellular technology that led to the phone in all of our pockets. Similar stories can be told about air travel, computers, the internet, and search. We now have the opportunity to innovate in something even more fundamental. We can divorce meat from the inefficiencies and the other harms of the use of live animals. Just like your phone doesn't require a cord and a camera doesn't require analog film, so too meat does not require live animals. Innovating in this area will address massive global challenges. 800 million people malnourished globally. The end of modern medicine through antibiotic resistance. The existential threat of climate change. The governments that innovate in this area will have bragging rights until the end of time. They will also be on the front lines of the meat industry, which is going to be a multi-trillion dollar industry by 2050. They will be doing very good things for their economies. So for the good of the world and to the great economic benefit of the governments that seize this innovation opportunity, the time for governments to invest in remaking meat, that time is now. Thank you.